Okay, just a couple more minutes and we'll get started. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Good morning. <laughs> I'm checking out the chat here. Um, just another minute and we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, my watch says one, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, just a quick introduction. Welcome to everybody who's tuning in to hear about sound in the ocean. My name is Emily Davenport and I work for the University of Georgia Marine Science Department for a group called EcoGig. Um, we're a grant funded group that um, investigates the impacts of oil and gas in particular, we were, were formed after the Deepwater Horizon accident in 2010. Um, and for those of you that don't know, um, or just to make everybody aware that Monday, uh, the 20th is the 10 year anniversary of the Deepwater Horizon accident. And I'm gonna be doing a webinar that day about oil in the ocean. So please tune into that. I'll have links to that at the end of this presentation. Um, just a couple housekeeping notes for these webinars. Um, I have the chat box up as I'm doing this presentation. So if you have a question along the way, please put it in the chat. There is the option to do um, a Q&A as well, but I can't get that box to show up while I'm talking. Uh, but I can see the chat box. So if you have a question along the way about something I'm talking about, or you can't hear me, or you can't hear what I'm sharing, please put it in the chat because then I can see it and address it as I go. Uh, that's the most helpful to me. So with that said, I think I'm gonna go ahead and get started and talk to you guys about sound in the ocean um, because the ocean is a really noisy place to live if you live in the ocean. <laughs> so let's go and get started. 
Um, so just to talk a little bit about sound in general, um, sound travels in a wave. So these are just a few options or a few examples of sound waves. Um, the shorter the height or what we call the amplitude, um, the quieter the sound. And then the longer the length of the wave, um, the deeper the sound. So you can see this deeper pitch has one long swoop instead of this higher pitch sound going up and down, up and down, up and down. Um, and in order to hear sound, it has to travel through something, air, water, gas, solids. Um, and that's why there's no sound in space because um, space is a vacuum. There's nothing for the sound to travel through. Um, and whatever the sound is traveling through affects how you hear that sound. So which do you think might travel farther? Let's think about this. Hearing me shouting or seeing me waving. Um, as it turns out, hearing me shouting is gonna travel farther. You're gonna be able to hear me maybe down the, a block away versus maybe not be able, you might not be able to see me waving at you that far. Um, and this is really important in the ocean because light doesn't travel very far in the ocean. It travels about six, 600 feet or so. Um, so once you're down in the midnight zone of the ocean, which is about a thousand meters, 3000 feet, um, there's no sunlight. So animals that live in the ocean have to rely on something else aside from vision um, to communicate and sound is a really good way to do that. Also, just think about water conditions in the ocean really play a huge role in how well you can see. So like in this example, this diver is swimming in really crystal clear, beautiful waters and the visibility is very, very good. You can see all the fish around her. Um, and so the animals that live here in this particular water condition would be able to see each other and maybe communicate that way. But that's not always, that's not the norm in the ocean. A lot of times it looks more like this. So if you're diving um, and there's a lot of stuff in the water, you're not gonna be able to see very well. Uh, so these, even these two divers who are very close together are not able to see very well. Um, and then I see uh, a question here, sorry, real quick. Would you share the slides PowerPoint? Um, I can make these slides available after the fact. Does that work? Does that answer your question? Go ahead and say yes or no in the chat if that's, if that's the possibility. I can um, put something up on our website maybe uh, or, or share a link. Um, I'll share my email address at the end of this webinar so you could email me to get the slides if you'd like as well. Um, I'm assuming everybody can actually see the slides that I'm sharing right now, hopefully. Um, anyway, so to move on, water so water conditions play a huge role. Um, like you can see these two divers can barely see each other. Um, so think about here, look at this. This is three orca whales swimming together. You can barely see them. <laughs> and um, you know, they you're only really able to see those white spots of the one in the fur the furthest away. So they can't see each other very well. Uh, so they need to talk to each other in order to um, communicate. They they can't uh, rely on being able to see each other. So usually, you know, what's causing this, the vision problems in the water is either lack of sunlight or just stuff floating in it. Lots of phytoplankton blooms, algae, uh, maybe a storm kicked up some dirt. There's often times where there's low visibility in the water. Um, so again, like I said, animals that live in the ocean need to find need other ways to find food, find a mate, communicate with other members of their species. 
Um, so they rely heavily on sound. And one of the reasons they do this, besides not be able to see very well, is that sound travels much farther through the water than it does through air. Um, so this is the same sound in air and water. And as you can see, the sound wave um, lengthens out. So it travels a little over four times farther in water and gets lower because again, that wave gets longer. So the sound is gonna get deeper, um, but it's gonna be able to go further in the water. And in the ocean, there's actually a special channel called the SOFAR channel. Um, where sound travels especially far. It travels so far. Um, and this is due to just a special combination of pressure and water temperature. And so there, this special channel is, just exists in the ocean and um, submarines use it for communication, um, but whales also know and use this channel to communicate with other whales across the globe. Um, and so because deeper sound travels farther than higher pitched sound, um, because of that, again, that longer sound wave, a lot of animals um, make very deep sounds, in particular ones that might live far from each other but need to communicate. So for example, this is a blue whale. Um, this is a the, the graph of the blue whale, but I'm gonna play the blue whale sound because they make very deep sounds that can be heard across the globe because they live very far from each other. They don't travel in groups usually. Um, so they need to communicate, whoops, communicate with other species, members of their species. So here's a blue whale sound. All right, so you can hear it's really deep. And that's just because that sound travels farther. So that's what works best for them. Uh, we've measured sound everywhere in the ocean, even in the Mariana Trench, which is seven miles below the surface. Uh, so here's a couple other sounds. This is a baleen whale of some species. contrast, this is ship traffic. This is the noise that ships make um, as they travel through the ocean. That's pretty noisy, especially in comparison to that baleen whale. Um, so you can imagine that maybe increased ship traffic might make it harder for animals to hear each other. So let's talk a little bit about how we measure that sound in the ocean. How do we hear the noises that the animals and other things are making in the ocean? Uh, 
that's a hydrophone. Um, it's, it's one of the most powerful tools in, in oceanography. Uh, most, most forms of energy cannot penetrate the ocean very well. Electric uh, doesn't work very well in salt water. Light doesn't penetrate salt water. And so acoustics are, are the best tool that we have. And it's also the best tool that sea creatures have. And for that reason, a lot of um, animals and a lot of what we do as, as humans in the ocean um, make noise for one reason or another, sometimes intentionally, sometimes not. And for that reason, we want to listen to it. And we use a hydrophone to do that. And a hydrophone is, is all it is, is a, um, it's an underwater microphone, similar to what's being used in, in the show here. But uh, what we do is um, we, we basically package a very special element that, that changes the sound that we hear into an electrical energy, and then we can record that. Oh, uh, yeah, there's lots and lots of different types, um, but they all boil down to, to one thing, and that is changing the sound wave into electrical energy that we can, um, that we can then record somewhere. Um, but primarily, we break hydrophones up into two different types from a use point of view. Um, if we want to measure um, sound at very, very low frequencies, then we use a low frequency hydrophone. And if we want to use uh, monitor high frequency energy, then we use a high frequency hydrophone. And they have, uh, they operate the same way, but they're, they're used and they're tuned for very different purposes. Oh, they're, they're very different. Um, the range that you can get depends a lot on uh, the frequency in, of the sound. Um, low frequencies can travel a lot farther than the high frequencies. They get absorbed by the seawater, the high frequencies. Um, and also it depends on the energy that's being trans, uh, transmitted, how much energy is in it. So for example, uh, an earthquake, uh, an earthquake has a lot of energy and it's really low frequency. So it can travel farther than any other uh, sound that we can detect. And uh, we had a, a hydrophone, a low frequency hydrophone between Victoria and Vancouver in the Strait of Georgia. And uh, we detected a high, a, an earthquake in uh, Indonesia. So a third of the way around the planet. And the sound actually propagated through the rock and through, through the center of the planet. So long, long way away for low frequency um, sound. Blue whales, they can hear each other and we can hear them over a thousand kilometers or more. So it's really impressive the ranges that we can get with sound, uh, low frequency sound. The high frequency sound gets attenuated really quick and typically there's not as much energy in it. And so uh, the distances are much shorter. For an orca, which is sort of mid-range, we can get maybe 10 kilometers. Um, for something that's really high frequency, like a dolphin echolocation click, um, a couple hundred meters at the most. So. The range is very, very um, variable. Oh, um, <clears throat> I think whales, the, the hydrophone technology has really revolutionized what we've been able to understand about whales. Um, we had no idea that blue whales could communicate between each other over the distances they do before we started listening to them. We had no idea that there was even um, different types of, uh, of orcas. There's a, um, residents, there's transients, there's open ocean uh, orcas, um, and there's different clans uh, of them. So <clears throat> until we actually started listening to them, um, we didn't understand what they were doing or, or even uh, how they were going about their daily lives. So, uh, it's been quite remarkable what we've learned um, from, from whales all over the world. For example, um, fin whales, we, we now know that they react to earthquake noise in the water and they can be singing back and forth to each other and then all of a sudden they'll shut up after an earthquake. Um, and we wouldn't know that they're even affected or even know about earthquakes if we weren't listening to them. Well, um, a whale, 
For example, with an orca, it only spends probably 5% of its time at the sea surface. And, and since that's the only time we can really see them, um, we're pretty limited in, in terms of what we can um, what we can study. They just come up, they take a breath, and then they, they go back down. So we can't really study much about their behavior just visually. So what we, what we use is passive acoustics. And passive acoustics means you just listen to what they're doing down there. We can also... Um, triangulate on them by having multiple hydrophones and and when we do that we can actually tell where they are in three dimensions in the ocean and so we can follow them around acoustically and see what they're doing are they swimming in a straight line are they swimming around in circles looking for something are they uh, following salmon or are they following sea lions or something so we can tell a lot about the behavior of an animal by the acoustics of it. For sperm whales, for example, we can tell when they're just searching around um, with echolocations or when they've actually seen some prey that's really close by and they're going after because they change the sounds that they use. Um, you can even tell how big a sperm whale is based on the calls that it makes. So we can tell a lot about what an animal is and what it's doing just by using acoustics. We use hydrophones to study orcas because they can get a different kind of data than photo identification would get or visual surveys would get. And also because it isn't possible to do visual surveys for such an extended amount of time or for example at some moments of the year when the weather is not very good to go out at sea on boats. Uh, hydrophones allow you to collect data continuously and um, for extended periods of time, for example, up to a year for some recording devices and hydrophones. And um, it also allows to see the seasonality of the animals, whereas with visual surveys, that wouldn't be possible unless you were on boats every single day. All right. So um, hopefully you learned a little bit about how scientists study um, sounds in the ocean. So, you know, we also rely on sound as, as scientists to learn more about the ocean um, because again, visually it's harder to have eyes on things. Um, okay, so they brought up in the video passive acoustics briefly. So there's two kinds of sound used by animals, passive acoustics, which scientists use, but also animals do, where they're just listening for sounds made by other animals. And then there's active acoustics, which are sounds making, or which are animals making sounds such as echolocation, which help them find things like food. So let's talk, let's look a little bit more at that. So here's a couple um, passive acoustic noises. Here are some humpback whales talking to each other. Oops. Back. Sorry, technical difficulty. Go. Okay, and then I see a question real quick. Um, how are hydrophones deployed if they're not being used from a boat? Um, there are like moorings and things that we kind of anchor out in the water, um, like attached, like you would anchor a buoy kind of out in the ocean. Um, they can attach all sorts of instrumentation to moorings such as hydrophones. So they can um, deploy them in places where they are interested in listening and then come back and retrieve them later. Uh, so hydrophones, like he, you kind of saw the man in the video holding the hydrophone at the beginning, those are able to be fully submerged and attached to somewhere and just left um, at, for a long period of time. And then they can come back and collect them and get the data off of them. Okay, here is another, um, this is humpback whales and dolphins talking.
Okay, so the this uh, uh, not as loud, the quieter like ee, 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 noises at the end. Those were the dolphins, um, and so dolphins, you know, can can do those squeaks and whistles, um, but they also can make clicks. Uh, and researchers believe that dolphins use like a snot filled cavity in their head to create these um, unique clicking noises that they make. Uh, and the clicking um, is not only for communication, but also for finding food. So it's for, it's called echolocation, um, which, so this diagram here kind of shows a little bit about like how the dolphin is able to make the sound, so they use their blowhole and they produce, uh, they, they release air out through the blowhole um, and they're kind of like squeezing it. So it comes out in a whistle, just like if you're letting air out through like this, the part of the, like a letting air out of a balloon um, and by squeezing it. So it kind of makes a high pitched squeal. Um, and then they also have um, inside their heads they're able to produce that clicking sound that um, there's these like, they call them phonic lips or monkey lips. Um, maybe because they look like the lips of a monkey, I'm not sure. Um, they are able to vibrate them together. And what they do is they send out this click and then it hits uh, maybe say like a fish and then that click bounces back and is absorbed, makes its own sound and is absorbed by, um, through their jaw. And the jaw has um, a type of fat in it that they call acoustic fat. And it helps the dolphins determine where that sound is coming from. So they can be like, okay, I know that my, that prey is over to my left. Um, and a lot of animals do use echolocation, not just dolphins um, and animals uh, on land as well, like bats use echolocation in a similar way to detect prey. Um, and then, so another animal that uses echolocation besides dolphins are sperm whales. And so this next video will show a sperm whale, you're not gonna, you'll see the sperm whale at the end, but you're gonna hear the sperm whale. It's actually using clicks to find um, fish that are attached to a fishing line and get them off the line to eat them. So these sperm whales have figured out like, hey, these fishermen have fish on a line and I'm gonna find them and eat and steal them. And what's gonna happen in the video, it's gonna look like the whale is spinning around the fishing line, but it's actually a, the camera mounted on the line that is doing the spinning, not the whale. So it's a little disorienting, not that bad though. Anyway, let's watch and listen if I can get my mouse to work. Okay. Okay, so that whale knew exactly where that fishing line was and that there was a fish attached to it and it was gonna get it off of there. Uh, it probably couldn't see it, but it could definitely know it was there thanks to echolocation, which is pretty cool.
Okay, so here is another example of active acoustics. This video is not fantastic quality, but just bear with me on this one, but because it's a really cool um, animal. So this is the pistol shrimp, also known as snapping shrimp. Far from being quiet, the ocean is filled with a cacophony of animal noise that can even disrupt the sonic transmissions of submarines. Most of the din is made by a surprisingly insignificant creature, the pistol shrimp. By snapping its claws, it can not only make communication sounds, but something far deadlier. These shrimps are its prey. It deals a knockout blow from a distance by using its claw as a sonic weapon. First, its claw is cocked like a pistol, then fired. The effect is literally stunning. As the claw snaps shut, it fires a blast of bubbles. Incredibly, as the bubbles collapse, they momentarily reach the temperature of the sun. This implosion causes a shock wave that stuns. Okay, so the pistol shrimp is actually one of the um, loudest animals relative to its body size. Uh, and if you're ever out, like even at a, um, in like the marsh or on a dock somewhere where the pistol shrimp might live, um, you can kind of hear them. They sound like popcorn popping. You could, you, I think in some places you can hear them above the water because there's just so many of them snapping away. And like the video kind of alluded to, they actually do disrupt um, communications with submarines. Um, there's a great radio lab episode about snapping shrimp, if you're interested in listening to that. Um, but the snapping shrimp is not the loudest animal in the water. It, the loudest animal um, in relation to its size is the lesser water boatman which is a teeny tiny little water bug, um, only about two millimeters long. It's the loudest animal ever to be recorded relative to its body size again, because it is so small. Um, and you can see runner up is the snapping shrimp here on this graph. Uh, but the lesser water boatman is actually pretty loud even when you're not thinking about its size, it makes a noise around 99 decibels, which um, if you were to like, scream at the top of your lungs, that's how loud it is. <laughs> um, that's you, if you're screaming at the top of your lungs, you're making a sound around 99, 100 decibels. Um, it would be also equivalent to being right at the front row of an orchestra. Um, so these guys are really loud just in general. Um, and, uh, they, um, I can, I can imagine that if you were to live in the water with these guys, it'd be really loud. But um, thankfully, the when when you're in the air, they, the the air, the sound goes away a little bit. The water absorbs some of the sound. So I think that living in a place where these guys near these guys, it's not going to be. It's going to be loud, but not as loud as if you were to live in the water. Um, and then the loudest animal, not adjusted for body size, is the sperm whale. So the sperm whale makes can make a noise at 236 decibels. Um, it's actually dangerous to dive with sperm whales because of the noise that they can make. It can actually, uh, divers have been hurt because of the loud noises that they can make. They can hurt your, rupture your eardrums, they can, the sound wave, the sound shock can actually like break bones. Um, just to give you a noise equivalent, 
Um, if you were standing near a jet engine as it took off, that creates a sound around 150 decibels. So, and you can, you can imagine how ear splitting that noise is and how um, people working at airports have to wear protective gear when they're around jets because it's so loud and prolonged exposure can do a lot of damage. Um, but a sperm whale is almost 100 decibels louder. So that's very, very loud. Um, okay, so fish in the water, um, they have, most fish have a swim bladder, which is an air-filled sac inside of them that helps them to control um, where they swim in the water column. But they also use that swim bladder to make noise. So here's a few examples. This is an Atlantic croaker. Um, okay, and then this is a blue stripe grunt. <laughs> so you can see where I got the grunt name. Um, and then this is the northern seahorse. So that's pretty neat that they, you know, fish also make noise and are talking to each other. Um, and then, you know, whales, shrimp, fish, other marine creatures aren't the only things that make noise in the ocean. Here's a few nature sounds such as lightning hitting the water. Um, and like they brought up in the video, there's also um, earthquakes you, you can hear, which I don't have a recording of. Um, there's sea ice cracking. And then um, hydrothermal vents, uh, which are underwater volcanoes also make their own noises. Um, and then humans make a lot of noise in the ocean. And I think sometimes we make more noise than all the animals out there, even some of those loudest animals. So this is a seismic air gun, which we use when we're searching for oil and gas deposits in the sea floor. Um, we also use sonar, which is human generated echolocation to look for things. Uh, submarines have sonar. Um, ships use sonar to map the seabed below them and look for things. Uh, let me see if I can get this one to play. Maybe a submarine sonar. Uh, and then I kind of played the, one of these already, but again, ships, uh, there's a lot of ship traffic in our oceans. So there's a lot of noise that comes uh, with that. I have um, spent many hours and weeks of my life on a ship and uh being above the water on a ship is very noisy in and of itself. So I can only imagine the noise that comes from under, underneath the, under the water as well. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit more about the seismic air um, gun, the, the blasting that they do with these seismic air guns, because this is a really big problem in our oceans. Uh, so let me share this video with you.
so a little propaganda that <laughs> I didn't make this video, um, but I do, I think that the, uh, the message that they're conveying in the beginning where it shows those seismic air guns just repeatedly blasting um, over and over. And they are just repeatedly doing that. They're dragging them behind ships over and over and over again, 24 hours a day. And this is not just happening in the Arctic, it's happening all over the world. Anywhere where we are actively looking for new places to drill for oil in our oceans, the first step is to do this seismic um, air gun blasting to see where those deposits of oil and gas are. And you can see why um, it's kind of like echolocation in that we're sending out these blasts of compressed air and they're bouncing off the seafloor and they penetrate the layers of the seafloor and kind of give us an idea of um, what is, is down there based on how the sound bounces back. Um, and the different layers in the seafloor, you can, they can tell when they find a big layer of say oil or gas that's in that sea, seabed. Um, and, but it's loud and it's disruptive to a lot of marine life. Um, so like it's saying here, the average seismic vessel tows 12 to 48 air guns in a single array. Um, so that's a lot and they're doing it 24 hours a day. So we are definitely making more than our fair share of noise in the ocean. Okay, and so that's all I have for you guys today. Uh, so if you would like to participate in more webinars, like I mentioned at the very beginning, I'm doing a special webinar on Monday, April 20th, um, all about oil in the ocean because it is the 10 year anniversary of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. So on the 20th of April in 2010, the Deepwater Horizon accident occurred and the oil that spilled from that well started on the 20th of April and was the well was not fully capped until July. It was an 87 day oil spill. Um, so, I am here because of that oil spill as my job is, it was created think, because of that spill. Um, and so part of my job is to share more about that research with everyone. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about oil in the ocean on Monday. Um, so if you go to our website, ecogig.org, there's a home slide page. Um, it's the second slide on the homepage uh that links to all the webinars that i i'm doing or have done so there are links to every single one once i am done with the webinar it goes up on youtube um, so you can access it at any time and share it with anybody uh, so our youtube channel is youtube.com backslash eco gig org epo um, and then if you have any questions Right now, I'm happy to answer them in the chat. Um, or you can email me at any time, ecogigoutreach at gmail.com. I check that email often. Uh, so if you'd like the slides from today, we can definitely work something out there. I can email them to you if you email me. Or like I said, this webinar does live live or does live archived on YouTube and you can access it at any time through our YouTube channel and subscribe to our YouTube channel because um, we share when we go live and when we post new videos and then you'll be notified. And also please feel free to um, check us out on social media. Um, I am on Twitter, Deep Sea Eco Gig. Um, I am on uh, Instagram at, at Eco Gig and then Facebook Eco Gig dot outreach. Uh, and I see maybe a question coming in. I saw a hand raise, but now it went away. If you have a question, throw it into the chat because i that's the easiest for me to see and answer. Um, let me put this back up so you guys can see that. Uh, but thank you to everybody who participated. So if you have questions, I'm here to answer them. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and end the meeting. I'll wait just another minute for any questions to come in. But thank you for everybody who participated. I really appreciate those of you attending 
Um, it makes me feel good to see that there are people interested in what I have to say. <laughs> All right. Oh, thank you guys. Thank you so much for appreciating what I do. <laughs> it makes me feel good. Um, all right, I'm going to go ahead and end it because I don't see any questions coming in. But like I said, please email me if I didn't get to you uh, to answer a question. Uh, so I did see that hand raised, but now it's gone and I don't see a question in the in the Q&A. So I'm going to go ahead and um, end the meeting. Thank you guys so much for joining in. All right, see you, hopefully see you all on Monday.